This week we're going to look at uh, quality control and inspection and really kind of start to address the, to the, the topic of you know your role as an inspector or a field engineer on a construction site, uh, specifically when it comes to you know, concrete material. And this is the part of the semester that um, really it becomes important because we're starting to focus on the ACI certification tests. So just a real quick kind of a contrast between the different materials that show up on a construction site. And I want to contrast engineered materials versus natural materials. Right? And engineered materials are things like um, you know, composite wood products, like these beams, um, steel, steel members, uh, foam insulation, or even just raw lumber. Um, and all of these materials um, have been designed and undergone um, testing in science, and their um, their performance can be predicted uh, based on statistical tests and um, basic scientific theory. So you know we know about wood, like these um, oh, these are probably two by sixes down here in the bottom. Every species has its own performance characteristics and when a species is cut to a certain dimension we know what kind of uh, compression and tensile strength those um, uh, those building materials um, can deliver same with insulation you know what kind of R value can we expect out of it you know the tensile you know, properties of steel uh, based on the the dimensions of of the the vertical members and the and the the, the, the flange um, so when you're dealing with these materials on a job site, um, y you're really just ensuring that the project is built in conformance with the design because the design engineer has already taken into account the, the known performance of these materials. And that's different with natural materials. And this is more common for us to inspect on a job site, you know, on the heavy civil type projects. Um, when we talk about natural materials, we're really just dealing with um, your aggregates um, and your asphalts which is nothing more than aggregate held together by a, a, a petroleum based cementing binder right uh, concrete down here again aggregates and sand held together by a Portland cementing binder or even just soil itself soil on a job site is a natural building material and um, the, these differ from the engineered materials in that we have to inspect raw materials to make sure that they meet certain specification tolerances, right? And by specification tolerances, we mean, you know, is the gravel sample taken out of this gravel pit meeting gradation requirements for either uniformity or um, non-uniformity, right? Does the concrete down here meet the specifications for uh, slump, right, for consistency between deliveries, uh, for air content to ensure durability, and for, for strength, <coughs> for strength uh, to ensure um, that it's going to be a safe product. So the role of an inspector, and in, I'm just going to kind of highlight a couple of the key roles here, one, it's to make sure that you're collecting random samples, right? If we go back and look at this, um, you would not want to sample gravel out of this gravel pile to, to I guess, test its gradation just by taking a little uh, bucketful down here at the bottom. More likely than not, heavier particles or the larger particles have settled to the bottom, and what you're not doing is getting... Um, a random sample um, or a representative sample, right? The sample that you collect uh, from whatever material it is or whatever natural material it is that you're, you're testing has to be representative of the entire delivery. So when a concrete truck shows up on site, right, they're delivering anywhere from 6 to 10 cubic yards of concrete. And you can't test every, every bit of that. You're going to collect probably a half to one full cubic foot of concrete. Um, but you need to make sure that that um, sample you collected 
was randomly collected from um, s multiple portions of that truck and that it represents um, the sample as a whole or the, the, the product as a whole. You need to perform your quality assurance and quality control tests in conformance with standard methods, right? And that's done uh, to ensure consistency, but also to ensure um, that you're not opening you or your employer up to any liability by um, not complying with standardized methods. You need to document the results, and then obviously you need to report the results to the contractor. Um, your role as a field engineer is to be the eyes and the ears for the design engineer in the office, and you're kind of that, that liaison between you know, the, 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 the designer and the contractor who's building that design. You don't work for the contractor, um, but you're there to help the, to, uh, to help the contractor um, uh, know that they're, what they're building is meeting um, the goals and the plans of those um, uh, project designs. So we need to you know, keep good communication and report results to the contractor. But what we, we want to be very careful about is to not offer instructions to remedy failed results if a particular sample has failed. Right, if concrete air content is showing up on site two percentage points lower than specified, um, you can't give the contractor instructions on how to remedy that. Because as soon as you start telling the contractor what to do, you've opened you and your employer up to liability because the contractor is just going to say, I followed the instructions given to me on the job site. So if you're testing soil compaction, right? So you can't bring in a new layer of gravel or um, uh, great base material or asphalt until you've tested the compaction of the underlying layers. And if that compaction is not meeting, you know, the pounds per um, uh, uh, pounds per cubic foot density compaction specifications, you can't tell the contractor how to run their equipment and what kind of moisture to bring in to achieve that. Um, you can only tell them what their results were. And, and that's a little different than offering suggestions, right? You know, as you develop a good relationship with a contractor, um, you, can, you can start to uh, offer suggestions if, if the deficiencies fall within your you know your your area of expertise, um, but but just be real careful of that. This is a big one that you don't, you don't want to take on any unnecessary responsibility. So we'll get back to the the the, the theme of this class, and that's the concrete tests. And the concrete tests that we're going to be talking about here are for. Um, the Concrete Field Testing Technician Grade 1. That's the name of the certification if you choose to take this uh, certification uh, in January when it's offered. And it's a certification provided by the ACI, the American Concrete Institute, and it's offered um, in Montana through the Montana Contractors Association. Um, these two uh, entities are adhering to the ASTM standards uh, for testing concrete. And ASTM used to stand for uh, the American Society for Testing and Materials, but now it's known as ASTM International and it's a worldwide standard. Um, the only time you're not going to be um, performing tests in accordance with ASTM in Montana is if you're working for the Department of Transportation because they belong to WACTEC, and that's the Western Alliance for Quality Transportation Construction. And you can see on this map here the region of states that are um, WACTEC states. So we have, had <coughs> we have had some students from this program get ACI certified. That ACI certification isn't recognized by MDT, so they have to go and get WACTEC certified. It's essentially the exact same testing procedures. It's, it's even a little less rigorous than ACI, because WACTEC doesn't um, require volumetric testing for air content and concrete. 
because they don't they don't deal with lightweight concrete. Um, so there's seven tests that the ACI um, certification will will test you on. There's both a um, a hands-on practical um, test that you have to pass, and then also a, a, a written portion on the all multiple choice written test on each of these sections that you also have to pass. And um, this is what we're going to be focusing on for the next month or so is going over the, the the specifications for each of these tests, so you know everything from the dimensions of the tools to the number of um, consolidation um, strokes you need to perform with the consolidation rods, to the number of times you smack the sides of the mold, to the size of the, the, the pots. Every, all these little details are what are covered in the, in the written test. And then the performance test is basically a, a, a pass-fail. Um, if you've gone through all of the steps necessary to perform the test, you pass. If you missed one, you fail. Um, but they are um, how to collect your sample, um, how to measure the temperature of concrete, what is the slump of the concrete, measuring air content two different ways. The most common here is the air content by pressure method. And ACI also requires you to demonstrate um, measuring air content by volumetric method. Testing and storing test specimens and then measuring the density and reporting or calculating the yield and gravitometric error of, of concrete. Now the sampling is not really a hands-on test. They don't bring in a truck and have you demonstrate that you can get a sample from that truck. So that's a 10 or 12 question verbal test um, that you do back in the shop area. And then you're also not required to compute yield or gravi gravi gravimetric air uh, off of concrete, concrete, but you will be required um, to report density because um, that step of the test is actually done at the same time as you're um, filling up your, your pot for the air content by pressure method test. So you're really only doing about five, five and a half um, hands-on practical tests here. I just want to look at each of these um, real briefly here, give you an overview of all of them, and then in the in the coming weeks we'll we'll focus on uh, one to two of these per week so we can really get a, a detailed look at these. But the first is sampling, and it, it, it's basically testing you on how you go about collecting your sample when it's delivered on site. Um, the test is covering everything from the type of container you're allowed to store it in to the, the, the total volume of sample you need to collect um, to how much time you have once you collect your sample to begin your tests. Temperature is probably the, the easiest test to perform, so it's the most common test people actually fail at least once in the in the hands-on portion but um, measuring the temperature of concrete um, is demonstrated by a, a thermometer but um, the specifications become is how often do you have to have your temperature measuring device calibrated how much concrete needs to be surrounding the temperature sensor and how long do you leave that in the concrete for and in what part of your sample can you test your concrete are the specifics that um, trip people up on this test. Slump is probably the most common one. It's the one everybody thinks of. Um, you have a slump cone, you have a consolidation rod, and then you have a method for measuring the results of your slump. Um, you can see in these pictures they're using this base plate with little wings to hold the cone down. That's not common. More common is for people to just stand on each of those two little um, um, foot pads to, to keep the cone down in place while you're filling it up with concrete. But people can do either or, you know, there's been a few uh, short people, <laughs> I'll just say, that prefer to use the, these little locking wings when they're taking the test.
the, the, the same apparatus here, the air pot, is used both to fill up the pot to report density of your concrete and then also to perform the air content by pressure method. And we have two of these pots. It's, um, it's a quarter of a cubic foot pot with a little pressure chamber on top. And essentially what you do is you fill this pot up full with concrete, pressurize this chamber, and then there's a release valve here where you're shooting that pressurized air into the concrete. And um, the results are read on this scale in percent of air that was forced out of the concrete. So it's a way of using pressure to measure the air content of your concrete. <coughs> and again, that's the entrained air, which is the air that we want, right? Those microscopic bubbles necessary to give your concrete durability, um, not entrapped air, which is rock pockets. And that's, those are mistakes. Those are things we don't want. This is the volumetric method of measuring air content of concrete. Um, I don't want to get a whole lot of detail right now, but essentially you're filling up a smaller pot with concrete and then you're filling up on top of that into this upper chamber water and you're going to fill the uh, water into this container until you see it um, all come up into the neck all the way up to the calibration line, the zero. And then you pick this thing over your head and you shake it as best you can. It's heavy, right? It's full of concrete and water, so it's pretty heavy. But as you shake it, right, you're, you're getting the concrete to release those entrained air bubbles. And then you, you burp it out of the top here by taking the valve off. And you see how much the water level has fallen down that neck. Because uh, as the air bubbles come out of the concrete, water's going to go down in there to replace that space, right? So that's a way of using a volume displacement to measure the air content of your concrete. That's the one test that WACTEC does not test people on um, because this method is used on lightweight or porous aggregates. This method is not um, because a pressure method will give you a false high air content reading, right, if you're using very porous aggregates. And the reason you would use a porous aggregate is you needed lightweight concrete or just a pure insulating concrete that doesn't have any structural application. Casting test specimens. We've done this a little bit, and we've kind of talked about the procedure. Uh, but there is a standard procedure to fill up both the 6-inch diameter 12-inch high molds and also those smaller 4-inch diameter 8-inch tall molds that we've looked at. Uh, the ACI tests test you not only on how to fill up the specimen, but how to label it and mark it, and then how to store it um, in the initial securing location. And that's seen over here in this first um, uh, picture. I believe this is from the Mackenzie River Project in Butte from a couple years ago. Right? Um, they selected a, a performed some cylinders on the concrete being delivered here and this box you see is an insulation it's an insulated cooler box and that serves as the initial uh, curing location for 24 hours right on site so the conditions that that box has to maintain are part of the test right there's a certain temperature window that your cylinders have to be kept at so in the summertime you put ice bags in there and in the wintertime you put heating elements in there to keep the the temperature uh, within uh, within those tolerances. ACI does not test you on the full curing. So these are some other pictures sent by, um, at least this one here in the middle is sent by a student working over in Boise. Um, this is a curing room, so this is a high humidity, moist room uh, where these um, cylinders are cured up to their full 28 days. Um, what's more common, what I've accustomed to seeing, is uh, offices just using these little cattle troughs, um, filling them up with water and storing your concrete cylinders in submerged water for 28 days um, to keep that moist cure process going on. Right? If you have a small office like we did at Morrison Merrily, this is what we had. 
we didn't have room to have an entire climate controlled humidity room like this. And these were two pictures just from some uh, former students. Uh, this one over here was from North Dakota. A student worked over there, and this is their field testing station, basically. It's really nice. Um, it's got this rolled-out table out of the back of their truck. Um, you've got your air pot with a scale, um, so you can do your density calculation. You've got your slump cone, and you've got your cylinders, and I believe this is probably their initial curing location, their storage location and you don't even have to bend over and hurt your back. <laughs> so what's more typical is this station over here, which a, a former student who's living in Boise now sent me. You have your wheelbarrow and a shovel, and you go bring a piece of plywood with you out to the job site to serve as your table. And um, you're always carrying a couple buckets around because you need water to clean this stuff off. And, and this is more typical of your um, field conditions, but um, we're going to spend the next few weeks on each of these tests specifically, so what I'm hoping you get out of the reading this week is just kind of a general impression on the importance of quality control and your role as an inspector, and then get a feel for the tests that we're going to be looking at in detail in the coming weeks.